perfect drama for a nationwide audience. Okay, now take four again, John. Uh, let me just see what it would look like without the white light. With the involved plot complications of the Celtic dynasty and the Lakers' revenge, viewers watched in record numbers. So Larry Bird's injury, of course, is number one, but the Celtics will certainly have more problems than the Lakers, and for more on that, let's go back upstairs to Brent. Okay, now take four again, John. So we are set to begin now. It is game one. We are down to the magnificent two. It's the Lakers and the Celtics coming up on CBS. Interest was building. Before the Celtics and Lakers would grind elbows, they had to square off against a different kind of opponent. Pre-game tension. It affects even the most seasoned athletes. For the Lakers, it was a tough battle amidst Boston's zealous supporters. The Celtics had their own case of the warm-up jitters. Their fans were so accustomed to Celtic championships that they practically demanded it. They were ready to chalk up another victory to Boston's illustrious 15-1 finals record. For both sides, pregame tension was inescapable. A world championship, the thunderous din, the superb competition, all beneath the legendary banners of basketball's most hallowed hall. They were the supreme ingredients for the year's most anticipated moment, the rematch of the NBA's best two teams. No team has won back-to-back -back championships since the Bill Russell Celtics, a legacy Larry Bird hoped to revive. Bird was one of five championship MVP winners on hand. Another was Magic Johnson, who vowed to redeem himself from last year's poor showing. But in a series highlighted by star-studded lineups, Game 1's pace setter didn't even appear on the marquee. Danny Ainge, the greenest of the Celtics starters, took over as Boston's floor leader. Last year, Ainge watched his predecessor, Gerald Henderson, riddle the Lakers with timely outside shooting. Now it was his turn to be dead solid perfect. Ainge's 15 first quarter points boosted the Celtics to a comfortable and seemingly effortless lead. Ainge has always enjoyed a fine reputation as a streak shooter, but rarely in a game of this magnitude. His performance was convincing and slightly unexpected. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's was simply unexpected. As the Lakers customarily do during an opposition's hot streak, they turned to Kareem to provide stability. But Kareem was wobbly at best. Robert Parrish threw Kareem's low post offense completely off balance. It was remarkably reminiscent of Game 1 in the Philadelphia series when Parrish dominated Moses Malone. Kareem's game looked flat, and his hustle was closer to a four-tire blowout. The Lakers were taught a first-half lesson in humility, led by Parrish's mastery over Kareem. The future Hall of Famer turned in his worst game as a playoff performer, enabling Boston to establish a championship record of 79 first-half points. And if that wasn't enough, the Celtics were thirsting for more. Casey Jones wanted to keep his team sharp. He inserted Scott Wedman, who promptly took over where Ainge left off. The sharpshooting swingman connected on all 11 of his field goal attempts, including an incredible four for four tally from three point range. Wedman exemplified Boston's day of perfection. For all the glorious games played in Celtic history, Boston had never enjoyed a game quite like this. The Celtics' 148 to 114 win marked the greatest margin of victory ever in an NBA Finals contest. Celtic delirium captivated the Garden. Even loyal Laker fans had to acknowledge this awesome display of basketball might. But the Lakers themselves were not ready to throw in the towel. They would have to come back from a Memorial Day massacre, and Casey Jones knew it best. This was a, this was a whipping. And uh, they're going to come smoking and burning, and this is going to be a motivating point for them uh, for the next ball game. Uh, so come Thursday, we know uh, we are in deep trouble, and we have to come out and try to uh, match the intensity that they're going to come out with. Uh, they were going on all cylinders, and they were primed and ready for the first home game, and they deserve a lot of credit. We'll be back, you know, 
If uh, seven game series can be decided in one game, then it would be over with, but there's going to be six more basketball games. The Lakers had their work cut out for them and buckled down to three days of preparation in cramped hotel conditions. The Celtics did just the opposite, returning to their comfortable homes to relax. It was an important difference for family men, like M.L. Carr, giving extra significance to a home court advantage. As a devoted father and husband, Carr's Game 2 preparation was accompanied by the warmth of the family unit. It was an off-court tenderness, completely different from his scrappy persona, one that made Carr the league's most scorned player on the road. But in Boston, Carr earned a popularity second to Larry Bird's. He was indeed a man of split personalities. I'd rather be the good guy off the court than the bad guy on the court. <clears throat> and fans always got to have somebody to hate anyway. And I feel like a lot of times they envision me as the embodiment of the Celtics. So they hate the Celtics anyway, because you're always on top and red all back in the system and the whole thing. And I always wanted to be a part of that. It was like a childhood dream. And prior to coming to Boston, I would always want to play with the Boston Celtics. So to me, it's a dream come true. Carr's route to Boston first began with St. Louis of the ABA, followed by a three-year tour with the NBA Pistons until he finally became a Celtic in his seventh professional season. Once a top offensive threat, the infrequently used veteran continued to contribute as the team's firebrand, a task well done during the 84 finals. This is not the march it down, boys. This is march it on to victory. That's what it is. March it down. Is, march it down is already out on the floor. Carr backed his big talk with a big steal to clinch game four. Laker fans were fit to be tied, and so was the series, as the most flamboyant Celtic reinforced his image as basketball's bad boy. If I sit up on the sideline and pouted about not playing a lot of time, not being able to, to do some of the things I did when I was 27, 28 on the basketball court, everybody would say he's a bad apple. You don't need him on the team. You don't need this, you don't need that. But then, in a sort of a sarcastic way, all of a sudden they say he's, he's a true leader. And I resent that, I really do. I'm over trying to pass on some of the things that were given to me. So I felt that once my time came that I had to sit, I tried to do something that was positive for the team. Talking about me, or yelling at me and calling me names is better than yelling at guys on the court that's playing all the time. So I orchestrate that and I think it's, it's probably helpful for the club. The speculation surrounding game two was akin to the opening bell on Wall Street. Momentum and strategy were the watchwords that fueled conversation while bearish sentiment sided with the Lakers. Pat Riley levied much of his first game criticism on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the man who had to inspire the Lakers after the most embarrassing loss in team history. In turn, the 38-year-old veteran publicly vowed to vindicate himself. As far as the Celtics were concerned, Kareem's resolve wasn't even an issue. Boston hadn't yet lost a home playoff game. After the Lakers' pathetic showing, nothing seemed likely to change. With three more home games scheduled in the Garden, a victory parade appeared to be a lot. Instead, Boston marked time to a procession of poor perimeter shootings. The jump shots that dropped faithfully three days earlier betrayed the Celtics, leaving them prey to the Lakers' transition game. The Celtics' marksmanship had considerably cooled. Even when Boston went inside, they missed. Again, throwing the Lakers' fast break into high gear. Basketball's version of the fast-paced L.A. freeway system. Boston got a rear window perspective of the Lakers drive to a first quarter lead. Much of the credit went to Pat Riley, who switched the defensive assignments of Magic Johnson and Byron Scott. The taller Johnson intimidated Danny Ainge's shooting, while Scott's quick hands had a field day on the Celtics' backcourt. Yes. The Lakers were overwhelmingly quicker and sharper than the Celtics. And surprisingly, they were more physical as well. Los Angeles adopted a swashbuckling style to break up passes and dive after loose balls, sacrificing their own bodies. The Lakers took any risk to disrupt Boston's game. It was ironic. A year ago, the Celtics were the aggressors. Now, Los Angeles had dramatically turned the table.
however no